Don't you do that to me. All right, guys, so thank you so much for your attention for a few short minutes this afternoon. Um, we've been asked to present some information on first aid, CPR, and AED. Um, when we're talking to such a diverse audience, some of you guys are fire rescue, some of us are at the library, some of us are in the field all day, so it's just difficult to um, make this work for everybody. So bear with me and please let me know if you have any questions. So what I have for you is just some good guidelines when you see something that just doesn't seem right. So if you go ahead with the first one. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about trust your instincts. You know, when you see something going on with a person, you, you, everybody's got that gut feeling. And you just kind of take that second look, take a third look, and challenge yourself, especially when we're working for the public and in the public sector, to take that extra second and to act if you need to. Go ahead. Um, as we've touched on a few times today, your safety always comes first. If you are going to respond to a situation and end up in the same sit scenario that the person that we're already worried about is in, you're going to make the situation worse, you're not going to be able to help, and you're not going to be able to activate EMS as fast as we need you to. So go ahead for the next one. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is survey your scene and obtain consent. We're going to survey our scene to make sure that it's safe for us to enter. Um, and we're going to obtain consent from the victim to make sure that um, they're comfortable with us delivering care. So you're going to tell them who you are, what level of training you have, if any, and um, what you're going to do to help them out. If they're conscious. When they're conscious, yes. So that's a really good point. If someone is unconscious and you're coming upon them, oh, you guys, fire rescue walking in, making me nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if someone is unconscious and you approach a situation in that scenario, consent is implied always. So you don't need to worry about that thing. Um, when the next thing you're going to want to do is assess your situation. Um, you're going to want to, you know, as you're walking up to somebody, is whether they're conscious or not, you're going to be able to tell. Um, are they having trouble breathing? Do they, does this person just generally look normal? Um, but you, you're also going to look for things that might harm you again. So um, hazards for you as you walk in and things like that. The next thing we're going to do is activate EMS. We are going to call 911. Um, and then depending on where you work, that might have some other implications. So for in the recreation department, I'm going to call 911 and notify the rest of my team, town manager, things like that. So I'm guessing the library and everybody else is going to have some specific protocols. Um, we've touched quite a bit on personal protective equipment. So if you are going to deliver care of any type to somebody who may be experiencing an emergency, you're going to want to keep those things in mind. We've heard quite a few times if it's wet and it's not yours, don't touch it. Um, so things that could protect you in a situation like that would be um, some gloves, um, a breathing barrier, um, and just some general protective equipment, eyeglasses, things like that. Um, and the next thing you're going to do is deliver care appropriate to your level of training. Um, I've never received training on how to give somebody a C-spine collar. That's not something I'm going to try to do that day. So um, if I'm on a scene and I'm a trained first responder, I'm going to make sure I'm preventing further injury, perhaps giving CPR compressions until somebody with more training arrives to help me out. And the last thing is to document and debrief as necessary. So if you kind of look at this list, this is a really broad overview of what you might do if you kind of if you come into a situation where somebody might need some help from us. Um, but what I'd like to do right now is, does anybody have any questions or comments on that piece before we move on? What I'd like to do right now is I have this um, ready reference guide that the Red Cross puts out. I know you fire rescue folks, this is not going to be something that you need. But for those of you that this isn't a regular part of your day, I find this to be a really helpful guide in some CPR and something to keep on your desk to peek at. and. Um, this isn't a certification class by any stretch of the means today, and if you are interested in getting certified, let me know and I can help you with that. Um, but we'll talk through some scenarios, but Dean's going to hand these out. If, if you're fire rescue, don't take one because I don't have enough for everybody <laughs> if you take them. <laughs> it's not going to be enough to go around, so I'll just... And if you don't get one, I apologize. I underestimated by quite a bit. Um, I'll email some to you guys and we'll get them out to you. Okay? What's that? A couple for you, yeah. <laughs> 
So what I'd like to do really quickly is to talk about a couple of the first aid and CPR scenarios we might run into as public employees. Um, I think it's been mentioned a few times today that it's very likely that, you know, fire rescue are not going to be the first person on scene. Those guys are, at, you know, we need to call them to get them there because they're doing what they do. Um, but we're spread out all over the place with the public intermingled, and that's likely going to fall on, you know, other staff to make that first call. So I wanted to talk about some signs and symptoms of a few things that I think would be really helpful for everyone to be able to recognize. Um, and if you have another situation that you wanted to discuss, we could certainly do that as a group. So um, the first one we're going to talk about is signs and symptoms of fainting. Okay, I've got our fearless leader over here. He doesn't look so good. Okay, Dean needs to sit down. He looks like he's not feeling so good. You can see his posture. He's leaning over. Okay, and you're going to say, Dean, Dean, I'm Sarah. I'm a trained first responder. <laughs> Do you need some help? Yeah. And he says yes, okay? Yeah, feeling faint. He's feeling a little faint. He's feeling dizzy. He, you know, he clearly doesn't look good. His body position's not great. I'm going to go ahead and call 911 because there's a couple of things that might go on here, but the chances of him ending up on the ground are probably pretty good. I'm pretty sure that's how it happened that day. So who was with me that day? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, Ed? I uh, slapped you around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't wake up, so we called 911. Yep. And so whenever you have that. somebody who's feeling faint or dizzy, you're going to want them to sit or lie down because chances are, if they get there on their own, they're going to get there a lot faster than we wanted them to. Okay. So you're going to want to have this person go ahead and lie down. Sorry, I'm just going to. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, Dean, lie down. 911 is on the way. What have you had to eat today? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. While we're waiting for EMS to arrive, I'm going to continue talking to him. Why do you think I would do that? Keep him alert. Keep him alert. And what do I know is happening if he's speaking? You saw right. He's, he's breathing. <laughs> okay. So as long as he's breathing, the chances of him losing circulation and needing CPR are hopefully minimized by quite a bit. Okay. Um, lost my train of thought. What other things are we going to want to keep in mind if someone who's feeling dizzy and faint? What are the other things we're going to want to help do for them? You guys can pipe in now. Sure, it's not hot, cold. Yep, heat and cold. He seems okay. His temperature seems fine. Anything else you think we should? Is he leaking any place? No, there's nothing obvious. <laughs> There's nothing on me. Okay? So at this point, what I would suggest for Dean is he's staying conscious for us. We're continuing to talk. We're continuing to chit-chat and keep that relationship. So we know he's we know he's breathing is really the most important piece. Um, and so we're going to wait for more trained personnel to get here and take over, and they're going to let us know what to do from there. Okay? Sorry. The day that I fainted, actually, uh, rescue did show up. Um, I woke up to Ed staring down at me, and that was kind of scary. Um, but um, I came out of it really quickly. I was probably out for four or five seconds. But I told you, excuse me, I told you to put your head between your legs, and uh, they said not to do that because you were... You're closing off an airway at that point, yeah. So I shouldn't have never told you. But I did that. I, I, I did that anyways, knowing I was feeling faint and yeah. supposed to get some blood rushing, uh, you know, to your brain. And uh, so... The other way to do that would be to have him lay down and make sure you elevate those legs to get the blood going that way. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about fainting? Anything to add from you pros? Okay. All right. The next thing I wanted to chat about a little bit is signs and symptoms of a heart attack. What do we know of signs and symptoms of a heart attack? Chest pains. Chest pains. They what else? They vary tremendously from person to person. They vary tremendously from person to person. What else? Indigestion. Could look like indigestion, um, profuse sweating, um, some confusion. What other things are we going to notice? Anything else? Trouble breathing, perhaps? Okay. What do you guys think? If you tingling, some tingling, numbness. In numbness. In extremity. What are our priorities? If we think a coworker or a member of the public is having a heart attack, we're going to call 911. The biggest, biggest, biggest 
factor in their survival is going to be early cardiac care and early defibrillation if they need it. So um, the longer we wait, the, the more their chance of survival goes down if they are having a cardiac event. And can rescue say now, uh, is it for sure that we're just going right to uh, compressions now? Is that like adopted? As soon as you establish that somebody is not breathing, you just go right into compressions until you, and put the AED on as soon as possible. Does everybody know where the AEDs are in their buildings? Excellent. All right, another thing that I think is important to note is choking. Um, we've got a lot of kids in and out of here. We've got people doing a lot of eating. Um, what do you notice when somebody's choking? <laughs> Grabbing their throat. This is the universal sign. A lot of times it'll start with a little bit of coughing. Um, when they're coughing, we're still moving air. We can still hear something. So encourage that coughing. Monitor that person. Kind of keep an eye on them for a second. But when it goes from <coughs> to that's when you're going to make that call. You're going to call 911. Um, you're going to make sure that that person, it, you're going to do everything that you can to get that person to remove that object. So go ahead and stand over here for me, please. So if Dean is coughing still, he's, you know, a little sloppy eating a sandwich today. <laughs> you're right, Dean, keep coughing. No, he's not okay. I'm a trained first responder. He's <laughs> <laughs> okay if I give you the McDonald's. <laughs> 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 so now we're going to do a combination of abdominal thrusts and back blows. And so we make a fist with one hand, cover the other hand. Gonna find his belly button, go right above. Five of these, one, two, three, four, five. Followed by one, two, three, four, five. And we were watching for something to come out. Oh. <laughs> okay. And so Dean, if you see the sideways for me, Dean's a little taller than <laughs> Dean's a little taller than I am in the event. That he does pass out. Do you see how my feet are positioned? I've got, I've, I've got this athletic stance, so in the, in the event that he does pass out backwards, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> We're not both going to go down right to the floor. So we want to help him get down to the floor. If he does have no air for too long, that's that's the likely next step. Okay? Any questions about choking? Uh, when my son was two, he was coughing. He looked at me and he had this look on his face. So I, we were taught at the hospital to uh, back face right on your shin and gentle taps on the back and I was able to dislodge it. A two-year-old? Yeah. Huh. He was eating and he was choking. Choking, yeah, no, up so, so his, he's here, his, his face was right on my chin, so he's facing down. So like for an like infant, what, I don't have <laughs> So when an infant is choking, you do want their, their face kind of right here and upside down like that to do back blows. But with a two-year-old, depending on the size of a two-year-old, I guess, and the best way to care for them. If they're a bigger two-year-old, you're gonna to wanna to do the back blows. If there's someone you can hold upside down, then let gravity work for you. Any other questions or comments? What's our next one? <coughs> next one is bleeding. Bleeding. Okay, so there's lots of different ways people could end up bleeding severely. Um, and we want to do the best thing we can for them, which is going to be A, calling 911, and B, providing direct pressure. A um, couple things to note, you don't ever want to, if we have a bandage on a bleeding wound right here, we never want to take that bandage off and put, oh, that one's gross, let's get a new one. No, we're going to continue to pile it on because the one on the bottom is hopefully doing some clotting and slowing down the bleeding quite a bit. So we're always going to continue to put things on here. Um, and that's about it at this point. We're going to call 911 and we are going to do our best and we're going to monitor um, their airway, breathing, and circulation. Some people can be squeamish. Some people will faint at the sight of blood. Um, some people might be losing so much blood that they're really not well anymore. So that's, you're going to want to watch them for shock and things like that. Um, and then Dean. And the last thing we had was, um, again, firsthand experience, unfortunately. Oh, for both of um, us. Yeah. Sarah and I <laughs> both uh, diagnosed with Lyme disease. Mine just recently, as of a month ago. Um, it was only diagnosed um, because I was in the hospital after I had fainted. And um, we asked for a blood test specifically to test for Lyme. And um, it came back almost the very next day as, as that. So I went on the um, cycle, 12 days of, um, what is it? Doxycycline. Doxycycline. And um, so I'm not showing any symptoms, but you know, it, if you know anything about Lyme disease, it can show up in many different ways. The uh, bullseye rash 
isn't um, a clear indication. Um, sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but you're going to possibly have some symptoms of um, joint pain or numbness. Um, you could get the sweats or the chills very easily. Um, and there's a whole gamut. So it's, it's not one of the first things the doctors check. In fact, while I was going through all these um, tests and blood tests in the hospital, they didn't even suggest or want to go there until we insisted on it. So it, it wouldn't have been detected unless we asked that. So, And also, um, Tom, Tom has these nice little cards. I think the hospital maybe has, the hospital, the library, sorry, has some of these available. They're actually great little cards has the symptoms posted and how to identify uh, between dog ticks and deer ticks and so forth. So we got a few of those left and uh, um, Tom, are we able to get more of those? Because um, I think Deb was ordering some. Okay. I ordered some from the CDC. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. They can only send 25 at a time though. Yeah, they, yeah. they don't send any at a time. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and the last thing about pulling uh, ticks if it's embedded, uh, the best tool is the uh, tick cup. It's a, it's a little cup with a v, v cut in the side of it. It gets down really close to the skin and it's basically, it's like scooping and it generally uh, pulls the, uh, the head and the mouth out. Um, tweezers would be your next uh, best bet, but tweezers um, can break off the head or the mouthpiece um, under the skin. And um, hearing a lot of good things about is it a mint? It's some kind of a oil. Um, lemon mint, is that what it is? You take a little uh, lemon mint and put it on, um, we, we had a joke about this at department head meeting, uh, on the tick's butt end that's sticking up because that's where he breathes while well, his head's under the skin. And um, this um, liquid actually makes him withdraw totally on his own mm. and you can you know have it analyzed or something, so. So, and then I guess ahead. I'd like to say if anybody's interested in getting certified in first aid, CPR, or AED, I have a pretty easy option, um, and I can put together a class if enough of you email me and are interested. So, thank you. Yep. Thank you.